Welcome to the Global Business Insights Podcast, brought to you by PSL. I'm your host, Max Kent, and I'll be joined by my co-host, Dr. Charlotte de Brabant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, funny, funny that I was kind of a witness throughout the journey. Yeah, you were. Always, yeah. always intensely, always for each milestone. Somehow, I, I was there to to witness it. Um, and I think one aspect that you and I both share is very much in being an inspirational leader, inspiring our next generation yeah. of talents. And as a host on BBC, you have the opportunity to reach a very broad audience. Mm. So how do you use your platform to inspire the next generation of talents? And what messages do you aim to convey through your work in the media? So what I would say is that the mainstream TV platforms, so back in 2017, they definitely dominated the uh, the roost back then. But we know in the last two years how social media has transformed the landscape. You know, we've got our, you know, LinkedIn's, you've got uh, Facebook still used by older people, but there's our Instagram and TikTok. Um, so it's, it's trying to work out how best to get the message across. So obviously the BBC is great. It's a really well-respected brand globally. But in the last year or so, I've taken part in a Netflix dating show. And, and people might go, Bobby, why are you going on a dating show on Netflix? That's got nothing to do with maths. But actually, when I went on the show, I was there dating, obviously, but I went there as a maths teacher. So they filmed my lessons, they showcased my students. And now I've got a, their glo- people globally are like, oh, he's a maths teacher from Netflix. So I think with, obviously, BBC will probably always be my home network. Uh, but I think it's trying to work out which are the other platforms which can help showcase whatever skill set you have, whether it's Netflix. And in fact, I'm going to spend a lot of time in the next six, nine, 12, 15 months thinking about how to really focus on my TikTok, because even with the BBC, when I have meetings with them, or Channel 4, or ITV in the UK, they often tell me, Bobby, you're a good broadcaster, you're a good presenter, but for us to justify working with you in the long term, you've got to build up a following on these other platforms, because that's where younger people consume content there. So actually, if I want to reach people, and our message is always about, you can always, you know, you can always achieve a lot more than you think you're capable of, and you can do it with a smile on your face, but if I'm only stuck on the BBC, I will lose my audience. I've got to diversify. So doing things like Netflix and hopefully my my early stages of my TikTok account, um, they're the ways of getting my message to more people. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got a first-hand experience of that as well. And um, yeah, you say that older people use Facebook, um, and which I had to kind of cringe at a bit because I use it all the time. Okay. So, um, But I am trying to learn TikTok and it's amazing the engagement you get on there. It's a bit of a dark art to me so I'm yes. right with you they kind of need to learn it and, and work out how that works so makes total sense though doesn't it that if you've got to build that following it, it's that currency that sort of social media currency now is so important um when we come back to teaching I've had first hands and experience of that as well um it's incredibly rewarding as I'm sure you found it it's also quite a challenge um How's that experience as an educator shaped that perspective? Um, so you're working with empowering individuals and communities. Mm. How has that helped you sort of shape your overall view? So what I would say is teaching is, is the most rewarding thing I've done in terms of my spiritual and soul sense. But also it's the hardest thing I've ever done as well. So what, what I would say is now I'm a part time teacher, but when I was full time, The thing about teaching is if you're dedicated and you really are passionate about your subject and passing on those skills to young people, it can almost like drain your life force because it's like you give everything to the classroom. I remember I used to work, even Fridays, I would be in the office as a head of department, but I'd be in the office till 11 o'clock, 11.15, and had a couple of staff who'd still be there working late. So, And I think actually what I've learned in the last few years is, it's almost like there's this phrase, have you heard if there's a plane going down and the gas masks come down, the oxygen mask, you should put it on yourself first, then the person next to you. And I actually realize, obviously, people that work in professions that are about helping others, you always want to help others, but you must make sure you look after yourself first. And I've learned that through some hard ways in my school experiences. Um, and actually, I've got a lovely story about a student. Um, in fact, what a student shared this story with me. Um, and I think it was, it was after school one day, and I had a couple of students come for help afterwards, um, after school. And another student turned up I'm like oh it's 4 30 it's nearly five o'clock I I need to head off and I actually had to head off I think I had some sort of meeting or a dinner with someone and I was leaving 
and then one of the students was a bit upset and another student came to me and they i don't know how this student obviously has some sort of like they're like a guru but they said to me oh, sir have you heard the story about the starfish i'm like no nah, what's the starfish story this is jenny like a 13 year old child telling me the story and it's about um there's someone on a beach uh and they see uh starfish swimming towards the the shoreline and the, the the sea is about to go back into the ocean and these starfish are stranded and they keep on swimming towards the the surface the beach so as the person you go around and, and picking up the starfish you keep throwing them back into the into the sea because you want them to live but some of these starfish they keep crawling back but you know if they stay on the shoreline they'll eventually die like 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 you know big whales if they're stuck on a um on a shoreline and what the student told me and i've always used this story is that you can't save every single one of these starfish but to that one starfish that you decide to throw back or two you've made a difference to them so obviously as an educator i'd love to make every one of my students love maths and have a positive education experience but the reality is for some people whatever reasons it's not for them at that particular time but as long as you can have that one student that one person you've made a real difference to someone's life wow i love it my gosh such a simple inspirational story um just continuing because i love hearing your stories maybe you yeah. can share another um inspirational insight of yours another personal story or mm. or moment um that was very much a turning point in your journey and that has had a profound impact on your outlook and and choices mm. i think it's actually to do with how i have leveraged on my name in an interesting way so when I, okay bobby seagull is an intriguing name i remember when i got a scholarship to eaton for my a levels so i was 16 and then some of my friends say oh, at eaton they're like oh bobby you know in fact my first day was amusing because i grew up on a council estate in east london and the cool kids in east london would wear like nike adidas reebok all those sportswear but my family were quite financially hard up so we couldn't afford that but at 16 when I went to eat and I was telling my parents oh my god I'm going to eat and I need to wear the coolest gear so I bought all the sort of Reebok Adidas Nike my parents really looked took a second mortgage to get all this but I turned up to eat and I looked like the fresh prince of bel air like the kids are like what is going on this guy like you look like I just I realized that's not the style there so then they say oh Bobby oh your name Seagull what tell us about your name and actually the thing that made me take ownership of myself my identity was they'd say oh where did you get that name from so my dad's surname is actually jose um i think it's from the catholic portuguese connection the Cath the portuguese came to kerala in south india in the 1600s so my family are catholic so my name should be bobby jose but my dad read a book called jonathan livingston seagull and i was telling my friends at eaton about the story oh my dad read this book in the 60s and 70s it's about an inspirational bird seagull that doesn't just do the normal seagull thing eating fish and sleeping and and mucking about doing nothing and stealing your chips maybe but this seagull jonathan livingston learned how to fly found meaning in his wings and tried to teach other seagulls that almost like greater meaning in life through flying and my dad loved that concept that he gave his kids that name and then when i met my friends at eaton i was explaining what my surname is and what it means that i'm going to learn something and one day i'll teach someone that uh, and i never realized i'd become an educator but that the mission of the seagull jonathan livingston of learning something yourself and teaching it to others has always been with me and that that was the moment where i realized that's my mission i didn't know how it would be a teacher but it would be it was planted there I think what really comes across with you, obviously, is the it's so inspirational. It's that energy and the excitement that you've got for learning and for discovering new things, and that sounds like it's carried right through your your whole career and your journey. Um, is there any specific moments where you thought that's a turning point? I know we've had a few already, but is there any yeah. more that, that have that sort of profound impact and changed your outlook and maybe shifted your direction somewhat? I think it might be actually we did refer this to it earlier, but it was that moment at PwC when I taught new graduates. Because typically when people do the teaching of graduates, it tends to be just for two, three months, it's a break from your day-to-day -day corporate work, auditing, balance sheets, profit and loss. And it just gives you like a little bit of a breather. But for me, during those few weeks or few months rather, it made me realize the skill that set that I can add to the world the value I can offer is not just obviously I'd like to think in another life I'm probably a quite a good financier you know that that, that was a, that was something that I worked hard towards but where I came to life and actually added most value to people is being an educator again I was teaching these young people financial concepts you know about business and economics so it's not school classroom things it's, it's for children it's adult education but it made me realize that actually 
communicating of ideas in a simple but enjoyable manner that's where my my real skill set and my life would be drawn towards i love it and bobby for our listeners today who may be also navigating in their own career paths mm. and and life journey itself what advice do you have based on your tremendous experience for those looking um, at also creating impactful choices for themselves pr professionally or or in, in their personal life so interestingly i'm going to refer to one of my friends from cambridge uh, it was a doctor and he's done a really successful youtuber called ali abdal uh, he's actually one of the most successful productivity gurus in the world according to his book his book is called feel good productivity and i actually have practiced his ideas without realizing that he had actually formalized this but actually he, he has a, i have it as well it's a little note on my table i leave it there it says what would it look like if it were fun what would it look like if it were fun and i think i've always carried this motto because obviously in life sometimes you've got difficult things to do things that you don't want to do deadlines projects but i always try and say can you inject something to make it enjoyable it could be simple as you're playing some really fun music with it or you've got a really great mug or cup of coffee or you've got a fun little biscuit or you know afterwards you're going to watch your uh, 30 minutes of your favorite comedy always think what can you do to make that task more fun because i think in this life often we things are serious but almost like mary poppins uh, she says uh, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down you got to take the medicine and medicine isn't always great but put a bit of sugar in it and it makes it fun so that's what that that's what we tell my students or or peers or people that are senior what can you do to make what you're currently doing a little bit more fun i love it absolutely it resonates so much with us especially huh. doing this podcast yeah right it's it's always a passion yeah it's fun it really does. And it's it's so inspirational to hear that. And I, I think that's something I've written that down as something I want to live by. Because you're absolutely right. You just add that fun element to it. And it mm. can change your perception of any situation, really, actually. So that's a real uh, metaphor for life, I think, isn't it? So thank you for that. Um, and the whole story of the whole podcast is a real testament to that perseverance, resilience, and said that energy and enthusiasm, that quest for learning as well. So that's real passion. And um, just as a conclusion to this episode, and I think we could probably talk all day. It's been absolutely fantastic. Any final pieces of wisdom or encouragement for anyone listening to this that's aspiring to make that positive impact on the world? Anything you could leave for those people? Yes. So it's actually for me philosopher, uh, British philosopher called Alan Watts, and he um, practiced uh, Buddhism meditation, but he had this phrase, and it says, be sincere, not serious. So I'll tell you what it means, be sincere, not serious. And what, an example could be, there's two examples. One is, you know, if you've ever played Monopoly, and if there's someone that's really serious and checking, oh, you've not, you've broken this rule. Oh, no, no, you have to pay 201 pounds and one pence. If someone's being super serious about things, then you're like, oh, it's not fun to play with them. But also the other side is someone's a bit like, oh, you take all my properties and monopoly. I don't care. I'm not playing. I'm not interested. That's also really not fun. You want someone to also trying to find that balance. Sincere is where something is important to you, but you approach it with a bit of a lightheartedness. And you're like, actually, it's okay if I don't always win. So it's that be sincere, not serious. And one example I read about was uh, when things can go wrong, when people are too serious. So this might be like a, a myth, but it's a great story. Um, so there was a doctor who's a surgeon. His job was amputations. And this doctor was very serious. And everyone in the staff respected him or her. Um, and uh, one stage, they were amputating a leg from a patient. And all the nurses could see that they're amputating the wrong leg. But they were like, oh, my God, this is so serious that, you know, this doctor, he never smiles. He's always uh, always just focused. And, and they let the wrong leg be cut off. And in this particular hospital, they, they've now changed the ethos to being like a bit more lighthearted. Uh, in surgery, the doctor can play a bit of light classical or jazz or some pop music. And now nurses feel more comfortable if there's a doctor making a mistake. They'll correct them because it's a sincere environment because the doctor obviously wants to make a real impact. But they're not just super serious. So it's like, is that finding that balance between being sincere but not serious? Because, and I think people can tell the difference because if someone's just serious for the sake of it, like, oh, why are they being miserable? But sincere, we love sincerity. Thank Amazing. you so much, Bobby. You were absolutely fantastic today. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode. 
we definitely found it very inspiring and thank you to our listeners once again for being here with us and until our until we see each other again until then stay curious and keep exploring the world of passion absolutely thanks again bobby absolute pleasure thank you